Good afternoon. I'm Chandra De Silva, the Vice Provost for Faculty Development, and I'm bringing you greetings today from Provost Carol Simpson, because this is the first of the conversations on teaching for spring 2012. Before I go on to introduce the speaker, which was the only thing I was supposed to do, <laughs> I want to speak for a minute about the Center for Learning and Teaching. I know that if you have come here for this event, you're probably among the converted, that you know how valuable this institution is. But I want you to remind others about the resources that are available on the web for people who are interested in teaching at the CLT and urge all the new faculty and the new adjuncts to make use of these facilities. And if you have any other questions, don't ask me, ask Alison. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll get on to the job that was entrusted to me, which is to introduce Dr. Annette Finlay Crosswhite. I could talk for a long time about all her qualifications. Most of you know that she was Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies. She was Chair of History. She's written two books and numerous articles. She's got the Teaching Award of the College of Arts and Letters. She got the Service Award of the College of Arts and Letters, and so on. But many of you don't know. One of the things that she bears responsibility for, she, 15 years ago, she was chair of a search committee that brought me to Old Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I mess up anything on the way, you know who bears the responsibility, <laughs> Annette Finley Crosswell. <laughs> Annette is going to talk to you today about understanding chronology and about, un and about understanding context. And you would not have come here if you hadn't seen some description of what she was going to do. So I'm not going to take time talking about what she's going to talk about, but I'd rather say I'm honored to introduce Annette Finlay Crosswhite, and let's have a conversation on how we look at the past, because looking at the past is not just only for historians. It is for many people in the social sciences because often some of the conclusions we make, some of the premises we come, we come with, all come from events that we interpret events in the past. And so here you are, Anna. Thank you. Well, Chandra, I have to say, you know, we didn't put our heads together before I walked up here, but the last few statements he just made are really a summary of my <laughs> talk. So um, th thank you, Chandra. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming here today. It's uh, really wonderful that the Center for um, Teaching and Lear Learning and Teaching, excuse me, um, has these marvelous resources online and in, in, in real time that we can participate in. So thank you, Allison, and, and all your, for all your help. And I'm supposed to make an announcement that if you have any questions or as we talk later on, you need to use the mic before you say anything because it mics to the video. Okay? All right. So let's get started today. I have a little format here that I'd like to run through with you in that I'm going to give a discipline specific talk. And I'm not so sure in looking over the video files of former speakers, most of the presentations are more generalized about student learning. And I decided for a variety of reasons that I was going to talk about history. Uh, in, on, in one sense, it may be that as the student here, so many have gone before me that they already took my idea. No, no, it's not that. Um, but I, I feel like discipline is broad, uh, history as a discipline is broad enough that we all relate to it, we all use it, we all need it in our daily lives. And so I think that in talking about history today as a discipline, that hopefully everybody here from whatever discipline you come from um, will benefit in some way. 
I'm also tying the end of this presentation to some work that I did last summer at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., tied to the Holocaust. I participated in a course there on teaching of the Holocaust. And and part of the assignment that I'm going to give to you today really stems from some work that I did there. Ultimately, I want to ask why are chronology and context so important to developing historical literacy? I like that phrase, historical literacy. Um, what it means, we'll talk about in the next hour or so. But everybody seems to use history, how historically literate they are. Well, that, uh, there's a wide spectrum there. And then I'm going to end with this assignment. So I'd like to start today by asking a couple of questions. Why do students and people in general love to hate history? Or we could even say love or hate history. And why might we even venture to ask why more and more colleges and universities are cutting history requirements for general education? I just came back from the American Historical Association conference last week, and many, many people that I spoke with talked about the fact that the, their history requirement had been cut from gen ed, and that was playing chaos with their number of majors and with the number of faculty that they could support. So even though history majors seem to be rising according to the American Historical Association, many colleges and universities, much like people, seem to be questioning the value of history. So that might be another thing that we can think about today. But just, just from you, why do people love or hate history? Annette, I think a, a lot of it has to do with how we were initially taught history in uh, grade school or junior high. You know, those people who, those teachers, uh, at least for my generation, who um, focused on, you got to learn the dates. And you don't really learn what surrounds the dates, you just learn to spit back the dates. Um, I, I think that has a lot to do with, is how you're first introduced to it. Okay. Absolutely. People seem to have a, a fear of dates. Yes? Well, there's a saying, with, uh, the love of something is, is caught rather than taught. Hmm. And a lot of folks, a lot of their, their parents had no interest in history either. So they're, they never were that exposed to the visits to the museums and historical sites and things like that. Okay. Um, I'm always struck being a historian. When anybody asks me what I do for a living, sometimes I hesitate. Out in front of, front of Larchmont Elementary School one day, a mother asked me, well, well, what do you do? And I told her, and she looked at me and said, can you really make a living doing that? <laughs> and my retort was, well, I think I have. <laughs> Some people we all know are history buffs. And Markets really depend on history book buffs. History sells. History books are extraordinarily popular on Amazon.com. And, and so we know that there are a lot of people out there that love history. And they tend to flock to big events, things like wars, World War I, World War II, the Civil War in this area is obviously very, very popular. Um, and they tend to have a kind of focus on dates and events, by and large. People love to tell me they're history buffs. Um, some people find history boring. I think 99% of the people that I meet out in the world who aren't part of academia and aren't my colleagues, when I tell them that I'm a historian, they often looked pu look puzzled, puzzled at me. One uh, friend I have in my neighborhood actually asked me recently, well, is there anything for you to do now that everything's on the History Channel? And again, I replied, well, I think so. <laughs> um, people use history every day, whether they like it or not. They might say they hate it, but they refer to historical events. And I think in this area, I'm always amused by the fact that um, people refer to the founding fathers all the time. I think probably that's true of the entire United States of America, but because we're here where the country began, um, we, we often get rele um, reference to that. Two days ago in the Virginian pilot, one of the editorials ended, what would our founding fathers say? Um, as if any of us, as professional historians, would even 
suppose the question that people living in the 17th or 18th century would have anything to say about today and the complexity of our society. Peter Stearns is a professional historian and he's made the following comment that I think is worth reading. Historians do not perform heart transplants, improve highway design, or arrest criminals. In a society that quite correctly expects education to serve useful purposes, the function of history can seem more difficult to define when the, than those of engineering or medicine. History is in fact very useful, actually indispensable, but the products of historical study are less tangible sometimes less immediate than those that stem from other disciplines. I can give you a, a, a moment in my own life. Back in the, the 1990s, we were going through general ed revision here, general education revision, and I was coming up for tenure. And somebody, it might have been you, Janet, warned, warned me not to say anything, and I didn't. But one of the history courses was on the chopping block at that time all ODU undergrads took six hours of history. Three of those hours were on the chopping block. And I'll never forget an individual stood up and started talking about how can I justify to my parents that the students are not going to get this critical waste management class because they have to talk about dead Greek people. You know. And in my little mind, all I could think of was Socrates, excrement, Socrates, <laughs> excrement. And somehow in my mind, Socrates seemed um, infinitely more important. So misconceptions about history. History is certainly tied to memorization. History is tied to memory. We have history because we have memories. But so often, as you said, it's been taught through memor memorization. We have things like the History Channel that I always call the War Channel, which seems to um, view history as the uh, telling of warfare. In this state and in many states throughout the country, there are standards of learning about history education. And for those of you who are parents and have dealt with your children coming home with assignments, one thing that is so obvious to me, who was not involved in creating the SOLs in social studies, is that they're based on repetition. Every year, it's the same set of people, events, ideas, with a little bit more added to make it a little bit more complex for the grade level. And so this idea that history of us is a set of facts that we have to learn is still being taught, even today, in 2012. My children have said, oh no, not Christopher Newport again. You know, and they're not that old, for goodness sakes. People in the past were more or less just like us. This is an idea I confront all the time. My students have the sense that there's some kind of doubling, that um, because we can read about the 11th century, we can well imagine or understand how people acted in the 11th century, even though their lifespans were perhaps 30 years if they were lucky, even though they dealt with disease and uh, issues like that in a much more complex way, um, personal way than we do today because they didn't have all the wonderful vaccines that we have and drugs that we have. And so there's this sense that um, that doesn't matter. I can think like someone in the past. And going back to our founding fathers, you see that all the time. People just assume you know how the founding fathers thought and acted and would think and act today. So what is history? That's what I'd like to ask. What is history for you? And I really don't want Chandra or Mara or Liz to answer this question because they have an unfair advantage. But would anybody here just like to tell us what history is? Simply put, I would say it's the story, our story, okay. the human story. The human story, the human experience. Anything that you could say about history would be um, contested by someone else. I just read something last night that history was not a story, in fact, that that was uh, too simplistic an idea. 
And yet, I don't agree with that at all from my perspective. Um, in terms of the way that I look at history, I see these grand narratives as well. And certainly reflecting upon the human experience is um, what it's all about. I've collected a few quotes that I like or cause problems perhaps, and I thought we could look at them for a couple of minutes. History is the systematic study of the past and at its heart is time. Now, there's a problem with that statement. Time, at its heart is time. Certainly we're talking about time, but all historians compress time. How can you write a book about Benjamin Franklin and have everything that ever occurred in his life inside those two covers? We compress time, we have to, we skip things. We discard things that, are, that we consider unimportant that someone else might not consider unimportant. History is thus both a way of thinking about the world and a systematic process of analyzing evidence. Both these quotes I like because they were, use the word systematic and it sounds important, right? Doesn't systematic sound important to you? Although how historians are systematic, I'm not really sure. I think if we ask all of our colleagues, Mara, how they are systematic, you get a variety of different answers. I, I write professionally with a friend of mine and when we go to the archives, we do two different things. She takes down everything, every word, of every document box that she comes upon. I read boxes and take excerpts. So you end up with perhaps some sort of system of analysis, but it's very different. And you could find many, many, many others. How do you privilege one system over another? Famous quote, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there certainly underscores um, what professional historians believe that, that the past is a very different kind of place and it's very hard to grapple with the past. It's very hard to figure out how people thought and why they did what they did. Um, and, and it's not unlike going to a foreign country and not knowing the language and having to navigate that environment um, that may be so foreign. foreign. History is argument without end. Peter Geil was a, a Dutch historian who wrote in the first part of the 20th century, um, wrote a lot about history, and certainly that emphasizes the fact that whatever any historian writes, there's going to be somebody else who's going to take issue with that version and interpretation um, and argue and pursue other particular um, interpretations. History is not what happened in the past, rather it's the act of selecting, analyzing, and writing about the past. It is something that is done, that is constructed, rather than an inert body of data that lies scattered through the archives. The problem with this statement is that it emphasizes the writing of history. But we all use history. Um, and history is business. Think about the tourism industry. Think about Ancestry.com. Uh, a million dollar industry founded by two Brigham Young history majors back in the 90s. Um, history is many, many, many things and it's not necessarily the written text. So when we put all this together, what are the problems with history for both professors and students? And these are some points that I think are obvious but really need emphasizing. History isn't a delimited body of knowledge. It, it, it's made up of facts, but those facts themselves are fairly meaningless without interpretation. History can't be figured out using formulas. It would seem more important to the broad public if you could. I even worked with an anthropologist 10 years ago on a project, a mathematical formula that would predict population trends actually, but it didn't work. Um, there are no scientific laws that govern history and yet it's about time and changes over time and history is everything that has ever been. It's formless. That's a problem because it never ends. Every time I finish a sentence, we're talking about the history of this lecture that is passing even at this moment. So it, it extends um, for millennium and it's always produced in retrospect. We always look back on history. So it's, it's very hard, I think, to pin down. 
We study history by looking at the remnants that have survived, but let's face it, that survival is hap haphazard. What archives got bombed during World War II, what archives were burned, um, what archives were just put away and forgotten. I'm going to use an example later on today that will show you the serendipity of archives and how lucky we are to have things that have survived in the past. Historians privilege some facts over others. How can you not do that when you're sitting in the archives and you're going through documents and you're looking at source materials? You can't take everything in, and so you have to privilege certain kinds of information. I love the statement, history is in the eye of the beholder. In other words, the history I write may well be very different from the history you write. We can look at the same things and make different kinds of evaluations, and we bring who we are to uh, a particular situation. We bring our entire past, and as the individual historians, we are different. Therefore, um, what we I can be very different. History also creates artificial constructs. We have to manage all that time. How do you manage all that time? Well, you can create categories. You use dates. You create categories. I love to tell my students, people in the Renaissance didn't know they were walking around in the Renaissance. They weren't saying, aren't we lucky? Look at this art. We're in the Renaissance. Nope, nope, 19th century um, creation uh, to, to term that period 1350 to 1530 the Renaissance. So we have to create these categories. It makes it manageable. It makes it manageable for students, but it's totally artificial. Revisionism is a part of the historical method. It keeps historians employed, right? We keep rewriting the past with each generation. All history is subjective and related as much to the historian doing the writing as the subject matter itself. My first book, Henry IV and the Towns, ended the way it did, simply because I was coming up for tenure, and my mother, who's in the back, called me and said, just put a conclusion on it. It's time to let it go. And that conclusion was typed that afternoon, right? Um, so it's about the, the situation. Had I not been coming up for tenure, there might have been another chapter. There might have been more analysis. It didn't happen that way. And then there's the problem with time that I alluded to, that you're constantly compressing time. So history is not the lifeless study of the dead past. Its purpose is not the memorization of dates and names and places. History is a living and evolving dialogue. And what that means then is for students, if history is a living dialogue, how in the world do we have a conversation with the past? I hope I've made you um, at least a little sympathetic for students that come into history classrooms. Um, how are you going to have a conversation with the past when you want to do more than just memorize dates or pass a test? One, um, historian has said, history is a damn dim, damn dim candle over a damn dark abyss, right? And I love this little chart because, you know, we've got Henry VIII and dinosaurs, right? And then there's Jesus over here, and I wanted to particularly point to Jesus because history also reflects civilizations and our whole dating system. The idea of this happened in B.C., before Christ, or A.D., Anno Domini, after, people say after death. But 10, 20 years ago, historians thought, well, that really privileges Christian society, so we'll come up with a different dating system. And now we use C.E. for Common Era and um, um, B.C.E. from before Common Era. But many historians have said, well, that doesn't really work because all that does is put new terms on an old Christian um, way of dating time. So even, uh, I think Jesus is there an important part in that little chart because it has to do with, um, at least in the Western world, how time has been dated even now. So there's all these many problems. History comes to us in different kinds of forms, and now it's getting more complicated. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Lee, said to me last semester, the students are reading their books on Kendall's, and there aren't page numbers. So 
how do you cite that information? Just coming back from the American Historical Association Convention last week, the president there, William Cronin, acknowledged that not only are readers gaining more and more of their content via screens rather than paper, they are doing so in even smaller and more fragmented bits that undermine, or bites, that undermine the richly contextualized interpretations and narratives of traditional history writing. What he went on to say was that we're using smaller and smaller instruments to read history. And he talked about iPods, right? Not iPads, but iPods. And when you start, you can't even put a timeline on an iPod. Well, you could, but you couldn't read it, right? So as we get more and more information, but it's disseminated in smaller and smaller bits or bytes, um, then how do you contextualize this knowledge? How do students put this all together? And where then um, is the place for dates and chronology and trying to um, incorporate dates and, and chronology into context? Doing history is complex. Um, it involves critical thinking skills and interpretations. And Peter Stearns calls historical literacy developing historical habits of mind. This means that when you read something, you're critical. You don't take it at face value. This means that you weigh the evidence. This means that you think about what society produced this. What was going on in that society at the time? Um, what, what are the events surrounding the production of this particular document or artifact? Um, all of these things complicate the issue. There are no easy answers. People were conflicted in the past. They're conflicted now. They're complex. And they couldn't see what was going on around them um, in a large kind of way. They, they knew their immediate surroundings. And so consequently, as historians, as students of history on the outside, as we attempt to interpret these documents or artifacts, we have to think about these big pictures in order to develop historic habits of mind. Students um, need to contextualize. They have to set the event, the document, the issue that they're thinking about in some kind of context. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do because students oftentimes want to assume, as I've said, that people in the past think like they do. And at times, we can often see that students will blame people in the past for not acting upon what they had no knowledge of was going to happen. So all of these things to create a well-rounded thinker means weighing data, drawing conclusions, pursuing research. Backshadowing is a big problem for students um, in particular because we know what came after. And so often we want to, as I've said, blame people in the past for not knowing what came after. We don't know the ramifications of the mess in our economy now. We don't know what it's going to be like in 10 years. We keep hearing we're coming out of this, these bad economic times. Maybe it's going to get worse. Who knows? We can't see that. And people in the past couldn't see beyond their immediate see either. Hindsight simplifies history. And all students have to be careful to not use too much hindsight um, in terms of interpreting history. I guess what I want to come around to saying is that we don't really know what our founding fathers would say today um, because they don't live today. They lived in the past, and our job is to understand how they interacted with their past. Now, I'm going to do an in-class assignment with you that's tied to um, solving problems and weighing evidence and putting in questioning this idea about people in the past that perhaps look just like us um, and maybe acted like us. And so I'm going to try and show you how in a classroom we might question those things with students. As I mentioned last year uh, in the summertime, I went to the Holocaust Museum and participated in a seminar about teaching the Holocaust. And as a result, I'm offering a class now on the French Holocaust. 
And when I first went in to the uh, session, on the very first day, the seminar leaders did what I'm about to do with you. And I didn't want to do it. I was just like a student. It involves getting up and talking to people, and I didn't want to. And I just wanted to sit there and have somebody tell me what to think. And I was really interested by my reaction to this, you know. Um, here I am, so many decades out of being a student, and I'm acting just like one as I sit here. And so um, the assignment is tied to chronology. It emphasizes the importance of understanding the progression of things over time. And as we did the assignment, it brought back to me some of my student days. I think over the 21 years as I've, that I've been here and students have said, do we have to know those dates on the test? That it's worn me down. You know, worn me down from absolutely to, well, you know, if you get the decade to, can't you give me a century? <laughs> to, don't ask me that question again. And I began to see as we were doing this assignment last summer that I, as a professional historian, had perhaps done my students a disservice by not really emphasizing how chronology connects to context. How chronology helps us understand how things happen and that chronology can help us create this dialogue with the past. It also brought back the fact that when I was an undergraduate at the University of Richmond, all of my friends were English majors dating business majors. And we all had the same general ed history class. And we all went to the all night study lounge where I wrapped paper around the walls and drew these enormous flow charts. And everybody always said they only passed the test because of my flow charts forgot that for 21 years or 31 years or whatever. And this assignment brought that all um, back home to me. So the assignment we're going to do today is tied to this woman whose name is Ellen Baer. And um, her journal was published in 2008. She's now sort of known as the French um, Anne Frank, although while Anne Frank was a young girl, Hélène Baer was in her 20s when she was keeping her journal. Now, this assignment is also tied, more or less, with what happens in France during the Holocaust. Many people don't know that much about the French Holocaust, even though there are thousands and thousands of publications tied to that particular issue. Um, the French, in fact, uh, capitulated to the Germans quite quickly in 1940 and set up a collaborative government and cooperated with the Germans um, to deport uh, part of their Jewish population. France didn't have a large Jewish population. There were about 350,000 Jews living in France before the war. Most of them had come in the 30s as they were fleeing Germany and Eastern Europe. Um, of that 350,000, about 78,000 lost their life in the Holocaust, most of them dying at Auschwitz because the trains from Paris went to Auschwitz. When you teach Holocaust courses, one thing that happens a lot is that students will blame the victims. Um, why didn't they get out in the 1930s? Why didn't those people just leave? Didn't they see Hitler come to power? Didn't they figure what was going to happen? Um, again, context, not really questioning how would you get out <laughs> um, of a country, what laws might impo be imposed that would keep you in, what laws might be imposed elsewhere that would keep you out. Um, but again, a, a, essentially blaming the victim. So what I'd like you to do, I'm not quite sure how many people we have here, but in this assignment that I'm hoping you can craft for your own discipline in some way, shape, or form, I, I want to pass around this envelope and you take one slip of paper out of it. And if we use them all up, this is my secondary batch. Not, these are maybe less crucial. Um, 
And once everyone has a sheet of paper, I would like you to put yourself in chronological order. These statements begin with a date, the dates we love to hate. Um, these statements begin with a date. Everyone needs a piece of paper. And then once you're in chronological order, we will read the comments. Okay? Some of the excerpts are from the diary of Hélène Baer. Other of the excerpts are just a tied to big events related to World War II. In a class, I would have 35 students, and I don't have 35 of you here. So this assignment would be more complicated. It would take longer to do. And there could be more contextualization than there actually is here because of the, the critical numbers involved. But I think that you'll get the sense of it. So does everyone have a piece of paper? OK. I'm going to take one as well. Um, Liz, if you can hand me one. So let's line ourselves up beginning the first person with the first date, which I believe is 1933, is going to go in this corner here, and we're going to line up that way. All right, Liz, do you want to start? OK. March 23rd, 1933, Enabling Act passed in Germany, giving Hitler dictatorial power. February 6, 1936, Right Wing Leagues Riot in Paris. September 1, 1939, World War II begins. September 3, 1939, Britain and France declare war on Germany. June 9, 1940, French government quits Paris. October 3, 1940, first status that Juifs passed. These laws defined who was Jewish and excluded Jews from positions in public service, the officer corps, and other professions. October 4th, 1940, French prefects told to intern foreign Jews in internment camps. 1941, Alain Baer, her mother and sister, join Entre Aides Temporaires, a secret network of people dedicated to saving Jewish children from being deported. On August 20th of 1941, a roundup of Jews occurs in Paris, and the internment camp Drancy is opened on the outskirts of Paris. March 27, 1942, first train leaves Paris for Auschwitz with 1,112 Jewish men on board. April 7, 1942, Hélène Baer begins to keep a diary. I'm just back from Arbenigenville. I'm so sated with fresh air, bright sunshine, wind, showers, fatigue, and pleasure that I'm not sure where I am. All I know is that I felt depressed before dinner in Maman's bedroom for no straightforward or obvious reason. The cause was sorrow to see such a marvelous day end, to be suddenly deprived of its atmosphere. Then when I got home, I found a postcard from Odile and one from Gerard, and his was hurtful and nasty. A few days later, she writes, I came home this evening and found the postcard from Gerard telling me he would not see me again until autumn. I wept, and those were my first tears in months. Monday, April 27, 1942. At the library, I saw that boy with the gray eyes again. To my great surprise, he asked me to listen to records on Thursday. We talked music for 15 minutes. We were still chatting when Francine Becri came by to tell me that she thought my the what she thought of my thesis after reading it through. I, I know his name. His name is Jean Merowicki. Before knowing it, I thought he looked Slavic, like a Slavic prince. Tuesday, June 9, 1942. This afternoon, it started all over again. I had to fetch Vivi Lafon from her English exam at 2. I didn't want to wear the star, but I ended up doing so, thinking my reluctance was cowardly. First of all, there were two girls on the Avenue de la Bournonnais who pointed at me. Then at École Militaire, metro station, when I got off, a lady said to me, Bonjour, mademoiselle. The ticket inspector said, last carriage. So, yesterday's rumor was right. It was like a bad dream coming true. The train was already coming into the platform, and I got into the front carriage. 
When I changed to the other line, I got into the last carriage. There were no stars. Thinking about it, tears of suffering and revolt welled up in my eyes, and I had to stare hard at something to hold them back. Wednesday, June 24, 1942. He began by saying, Well, Ellen, I saw your father this morning, and he left a note for you. I didn't understand a word he was saying, or what he went on saying but I realized I wasn't listening to anything he was saying. And the note, I kept that too. It was on Kuhlmann's letterhead. I remember it was even dated at 9.30 a.m. on June 23rd, and in Papa's neat hand. A police officer is taking me, and then after a blank space, I don't know why. Around 12.30, the phone rang. The voice was that of a man we did not know. We understood in a flash. It was the police officer who had arrested Papa. The officer said that Papa would be released had his star been correctly stitched on. At the Drancy camp, all the stars are stitched on. So that made us realize that he was on his way to Drancy. Wednesday, July 15th, 1942. Something is brewing, something that will be a tragedy, maybe the tragedy. Mr. Simone came around this evening at 10 to warn us that he'd been told about a roundup for the day after tomorrow, 20,000 people. A wave of terror has been gripping everybody else as well these past few days. It appears that the SS have taken command in France and that terror must follow. July 16th through 17th, 1942. Beldiv Roundup. Over 14,000 Jews are interned in a bicycle sports stadium for five days with little food or water or sanitation. The deportations begin five days later. Sunday, July 19th, 1942. One woman lost her mind and threw four children out of the window. The placement worked in teams of six with electric flashlights. Mr. Bauscher gives us news of the Vetrodome de Harver. 12,000 people are incinerated. It's hell. Many deaths already. Sanitary facilities blocked up, etc. Later that day, Helene went to the Union General de Israelites de France, the UGIF or General Union of Israelites in France, and applied for voluntary employment. This organization oversaw a number of Jewish charities and was recognized by the Vinci authorities. She was given identity papers and must have felt protected from deportation. Tuesday, July 21st, 1942. Other details from Isabel. 15,000 men, women, and children at the Velodrome d'Hiver, so crowded together they can only squat, they get trodden on. Not a drop of water, the Germans have cut off the water in the gas mains. The ground has turned into sticky, gluey mud. On Thursday, Madame Carpentier saw two goods trains at Drancy in which men and women had been stacked like cattle without even any straw for deportation. Friday, August 7th, 1942. People will not understand why we stayed. We don't have the right not to want to escape. But is invading an inevitable fate of real escape? As for me, I'm still convinced. It's just that all you have by the way of approval is your own conscience. Friday, August 21st, 1942. Rue de la Bienfrancaise. I hope Susan's process the people coming into the office. It's lamentable. Almost everybody gets stopped trying to cross the demarcation line. And that means instant deportation. What a pile of trouble for each of these people. And when we opened the parcel that has been returned and they saw the ring of their mother's or father's watches, it was unbearable. All the children at the Beyond Camp have been brought to Drancy, probably for deportation. They play out in the yard. Their sores and lices make, th make them quite repulsive. Poor little souls. Monday, November 1, 1943. I finished the Immoralist last night, and I don't think I understand Guy. Geed. 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 I can't manage to comprehend the meaning of his books, but it is barely hinted at. 
The problem isn't put squarely. No, I don't like Guy. We never heard more about the convoy of March 27, 1942. There was also talk of asphyxiating gas being administered to the convoys at the Polish border. There must be some truth behind these rumors. It is raining death on earth. March 8, 1944, 7.30 a.m. Hélène Baer is arrested in her apartment and transferred to Drancy. She was deported to Auschwitz on March 27, 1944, her 23rd birthday. Later, she was transferred to Bergen-Belsen five days before the camp was liber liberated. To, she was beaten to death when she was too sick to rise from her bed for roll call. I tried this with my students. And to my surprise, they loved it. They wrote all about it in my teaching evaluations, saying it was the most wonderful assignment. And I think the reason that it works, aside from the pedagogical aspect of you're identifying with the victim, you're hearing the actual words from the primary sources, all the things that a historian might note is important about an assignment like this that you see the progression of time. You can see how um, in the beginning she's worried about losing one love and beginning a new affair with another and, and all these things in the midst of this, this war situation. But beyond all that, when you use this kind of assignment in a classroom, what happens is that students aren't sitting there anymore. They have to get up and interact with each other. And they seem to really like that. And if you use the assignment and assignments like this often enough, what happens is that students begin to talk with each other. And they're not standing beside the person that they're sitting beside. They're standing beside someone who's in chronological order related to the assignment. So this isn't the kind of thing you would use every class. But over the course of a whole semester, in a number of different ways, it's a way of getting the class to, to gel together at the same time that they're all working on an assignment. They're all experiencing the, the assignment in the same way. And it's not, well, someone didn't finish the journal, they didn't, they didn't do the homework, they didn't come to class prepared. It, it's one of these situations where you learn as you sit and listen to what is being read. And then, Aside from the obvious point of this assignment is, is to show that why did Hélène Baer stay in Paris? Why do we not blame her for staying in Paris? Why is she not um, responsible for her own death? What, what's, the, what's the big um, issue here? She even said not wearing the star was cowardly. Okay, so she's fighting back in her own way. Also, it's very important to note, and had you read the journal, you would know this uh, explicitly, explicitly, and that is that she stayed on purpose. She was helping to save Jewish children by finding them places to hide and be taken care of, and she's actually responsible for saving the lives of 600 Jewish children. So she had a mission, and her mission was larger than herself, and she was consciously aware of what she was doing. She, she decides in 42 to keep this journal. And how do we have it? Because every few days, she ripped the pages out and gave them to her cook with the promise that the cook would hold on to them. And at the end of the war, the cook would give this journal to her boyfriend, right? And so then the story becomes, why do we only have this in 2008? Why are we just finding about at this about, why are we just finding out about this now? Again, the serendipity of archives, the, the haphazard way that they come to us. Isn't that interesting? Um, Ellen Baer had several sisters that survived the war. At war's end, they went back to Paris and lived their lives out. One of her sisters had a child who was obsessed with the life of her aunt. She says she grew up constantly asking questions. In 1992, she decided to try and find the journal. So she went to track down Hélène Baer's former boyfriend. And she found him. 
and the journal was on the top of a cupboard and he was afraid to look at it. He left it there all those years because it was too painful to read. He'd read it when it first came to him, then tucked it away. And who knows had he died, who knows what would have happened to those pieces of paper. So in 1992, Mariette Job, the niece of Ellen Bear, gets the journal. And then she sits on it for a long time, not quite sure what to do with it. In 2002, she takes it to the equivalent of the Holocaust Museum in, in Paris, the Memorial de la Shoah. And they realize what an incredible rich find it is. It's published in 2008. So it's rediscovered in 92, becomes available to the public in 2008, sells out of its first print run in two days, um, becomes an international big hit, translated and published in English, becomes a, an international bestseller. So um, there, there are ways of using assignments like this. In fact, in the classroom assignment that I use, we carry it out to 2008. We see, we see that haphazard way that historians get access to archives. So the assignment can do many things. It can teach historical methods. It can teach historical context. Um, it can teach us that we really can't put ourselves into the shoes of Alain Baer. Um, and know what it was like to live in Vichy, in, in, in German-occupied Paris in the middle of World War II um, and evaluate what we might have done. There are a number of other ways of using an assignment like this. She talks about the Valdiv Roundup that occurred in July of 1942 when these 14,000 Jews were placed in a sports stadium, a bicycle stadium, um, and ultimately deported to Auschwitz. This is the only picture that is, exists of that event. Last summer when I was at the Holocaust Museum, everybody was trying to find some other picture. And this is it. This is the one that exists. So the French police, not the Germans, the French police managed to use public transportation and in an, over two days round up 14,000 Jews and put them for five days in this sports stadium and nobody took a picture of it. So that leads itself to another kind of conversation about bystanders, bystanders and responsibilities. Certainly there were houses all around the stadium. Nobody took a picture. They say people at night couldn't sleep because of the screams coming out of the stadium. Nobody reported. Um, these two pictures here I, I'm most pleased to show you because last summer I was working on this, this issue of the synagogue bombings that took place in, in Paris in October of 1941, and I don't believe anyone's seen these pictures. Um, certainly, certainly the Jewish consistor, consistory in Paris is aware of them, but I can't see that these synagogue bombings have ever been dealt with in literature except very briefly, and I've never seen pictures. But this is where Hélène Baer worshipped. Um, she speaks in the, in, the, in the journal about going to the synagogue on the Rue de, de la Victoire. Um, and she talks about the fact that they can't use the synagogue anymore because it's been bombed. So um, there, uh, there, there are, are ways of, of pushing the journal in any number of ways to expand the history that it tells um, as we talk about these very conflicted times. To end, chronology matters. Raoul Hilberg was a great Holocaust scholar, perhaps the first Holocaust scholar, some would say, and he always said, how did the Holocaust happen day by day? And I would emphasize in an assignment like this that how did people experience the Holocaust? They experienced it like they experienced all history, like we experience historical events day by day. And if we can keep that in student minds, then I think that they'll have a, a, a richer appreciation for history and a, a better understanding of how you contextualize things. My last question for you is I'm hoping, or ultimately I think, that you could develop a chrono chronologically based assignment in your own discipline um, that might work in a way um, to emphasize the importance of context, chronology and context in your own discipline that would get students thinking on their feet, um, not 
passing out in the back of the room, but getting up and participating on those hot days when the rooms are hot, and um, ultimately working collectively as a group inside a classroom. My question was, anyone here not from history might be able, can you see how you might use an assignment like this in your teaching? I teach philosophy, and it's the only way to really get them thinking and interacting with each other, as philosophy requires interaction. Mm -hmm. I tell them it's not me talking to you, talking at you, it's you all talking to each other and putting yourself in another mindset. Okay, good. Anybody else? I, I think you have to have the mic. Well, <laughs> okay, I have to apologize, but I, I realize we are we're, we're right now uh, no, we've well, had a minus few, five seconds we've got uh, a few left minutes. or something, but uh, I'm, I'm definitely outside history. I'm, I'm uh, in the Department of Mathematics and, and Statistics. And uh, actually, my, my, my question isn't about this. It's about the previous slide you just presented. Uh, and actually, there's some question about the Holocaust, uh, how and... Uh, this one? How, yeah, how uh, did it happen and so forth. Uh, I think right. even, even bigger question is why, how come? And I think um, to, to, to a large extent, uh, every democracy in the world, including this one, uh, has a huge responsibility to continue to teach their students uh, about history because with democracy comes a great deal of re responsibility. Responsibility which Weimar Republic, which was a democracy, even though it was deficient in many ways, uh, its citizens failed that test back in the early 30s where over 30 percent of people voted for Nazis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and with, with that thing, I mean, when, 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 you, when your students question, how, how come the victims didn't do this or that? Or how come somebody didn't take a picture or something? That's, I mean, that's relevant, but uh, a you know, hundred times more relevant is how come in the, in the democratic society people actually voted Nazis into power, mm -hmm. where basically from there on the events more or less unfolded in a, in a way that could only be stopped by brute force in, in, the, in 45. Well. And, uh, so, uh, that's all I have to say. In a certain way, you're asking the exam question, right? <laughs> we're, we're talking about well, it justifies right, right. Why, why history matters. Right. Um, when, whenever Absolutely. someone questions why should why should it be taught, that's mm -hmm. the single most important thing there is. Right. I, I, if there's nothing for someone, I don't know what is. Right. And what I like about this assignment is that it gets you to identify with the people that it were experiencing the events at the time. And then you can ask those key questions about how could this happen in France? I mean, France. Uh, who, because of the French Revolution, you know, Jews are, are awarded citizenship right after, right, as part of the revolution. So the, the shocking horror of this is that, yes, it happened in France. And what does that mean about the precarious nature of democracy, Republican government? Anything else? Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming today. I really appreciate it.